یادم رفت همسرم گفت نه داروی استیج سلام به همگی خیلی خوشحالم که دوباره اومدم به شهر زیبای سان فرانسیسکو ولی دلم میخواد خیلی با شما آنست باشم واقعیتش اینه که ما توی تصادفی گیر کردیم پروازمون یک ساعت تاخیر داشت گل سرمو گم کردم و همه چیز دست به دست هم داد به قول ما ایرانی ها کار کار خودشون بود <تصفيق> میخواستن که من به اینجا نرسم ولی در خدمت شما و خیلی خوشحالم که یک بار دیگه مهمان خانواده او oh, wow, I'm speaking in Persian oh I'm so sorry <laughs> I am so sorry Hi everyone <laughs> When I see Iranians especially some, you know, familiar face, like my mother's, I totally get emotional. So I don't know why I started to speak in Persian. <laughs> and um, so let's begin. <laughs> It is a great honor to be here at Stanford University. I was going to say that it was my dream to be here, but to be honest, Growing up in a small village, in a tiny village, I never knew that Stanford even existed. So I never had this dream. My dream in my tiny village was just to visit the closest town, Babol. And then when I became a teenager, my dream was just to visit Tehran, the capital of Iran. Now living in exile, for nine years. My dream has changed. And I want to visit my tiny village, which became the capital of the world, in my opinion. <laughs> And that means living in exile is not easy. I've been fighting for my dream to get my word out, to speak up, not getting stuck in the village. But right now, My dream is to get back to the you know, village that I belong. But I cannot. Why? Because of what I've been doing as a journalist, what I have been doing as a women's rights activist, what I have been doing as a troublemaker. <laughs> And this is actually what makes the Iranian government mad and angry. But what I want all women in Iran to be a headache for the oppressors, to be a nightmare, for the oppressors. So when I left Iran, I had to do it. It was not easy at all, because I was a political journalist. And my main focus was about politics, about so-called bigger problems. So now I am here to tell you how we have to use our personal story to encourage other people. Because for the government of Iran, it is really easy to oppress organization, to oppress women's rights movement, you know, political activists, student activists, right now workers. But if you make every individual person as a leader, it's not easy. They can't go to every individual person who became a leader, who became an agent of change, and oppress them individually. That is why my dream was this. Instead of waiting for someone to be my leader, to come and save me, I started to be a savior, to be a leader. So I'm going to tell you my personal story on that. You can get why and how I became a troublemaker and a leader in my tiny village. Of course, it was not from my books. The books in Iran never teach you how to be a feminist, how to fight for freedom. Of course, it was not from educational system. All we learn from educational system or books in Iran, you're a second class citizen. Or how to communicate with the rest of the world. As you know, death to America, burning a flag. This is the way that we have been educated in Islamic Republic of Iran. But today, I am here to tell you that Islamic Republic is in a serious crisis. Not from the United States of America, as they called it the biggest enemy. For the Islamic Republic of Iran, there are three main pillars. Death to America, death to Israel, and hijab, compulsory hijab. So 
the Islamic Republic is in a serious crisis just because of its own women. So how to be a leader? I grew up in a tiny village where we never had a, you know, the time when I grew up there, we never had electricity. We never had inside bathroom. We had outhouse, and I know many of you are familiar with, the, with outhouse in our backyard garden. I was only seven or eight or 10 years old, going to the outhouse during the night. It was not easy. It was dark. It was blacker than black, if such a thing is possible. So for me, it was not easy. My mom used to tell me, this is your job. You have to do it on your own. Never ask anyone else to do your work. So I learned from my mother how. It was scary. My mom said that darkness is like a monster. If you let your fear win, then the darkness can devour you. The darkness can swallow you all. Just open your eyes as wide as you can, then the darkness will disappear. I was a kid and I thought this is a fact. So when I used to go to the bathroom, outhouse, in the backyard garden, no electricity, dark, I used to open my eyes as wide as I could. And I thought this is working. This is the way that I learned from my mother who is not able to read and write, but I learned how to defeat the darkness. I experienced so many darkness in my life, like many other women, Iranian women, not even in Iran, in the Middle East. So I had to learn how to be a warrior rather than a victim, as my mom said. Instead of asking someone else to come and save me, I had to be a savior. And how? I had a little brother, as I told you, I never learned, I never had a clue about equality. I never had a clue about feminism. Some of you might, in Iranian family, you grew up in a really educated family, so you know that you got it from your family, from going to university. But for me, my brother was the most visible example of freedom that I wanted to have. He was the Shah Pesar. You know that I cannot even translate the other word that we Iranian used to. <laughs> Can I say that? He was the king of the village, like many other boys. But my body was a shame. Not only me, many other you know, women, girls in the village, we had to hide ourselves. But Shah Pesar had his own special picture in the album. And you know, all the Iranian people, they have this, let me say that, Dudul Tala picture. <laughs> Nobody translate that. <laughs> so, the king of the village, don't translate for my stepdaughter. <laughs> the king of the village. Maybe now we are laughing, but it was not easy for me to watch him jumping in the river, riding a bicycle, playing with boys around easily as, as you know, much as he could, he wanted. But the king of the village, my brother was scared of the darkness. I learned from my mother how to defeat the darkness. So I had to use that. Like you know, many women in Iran right now using this. They are not allowed to enter the stadiums. Men are allowed to go and enjoy themselves. So that was in my house, I was not allowed to go out and play. I was not allowed to jump in the river, not allowed to ride a bicycle, not allowed to sing, not allowed to show my hair. So I asked my brother, if you don't take me with you to be free as you are free, then I won't take you to the bathroom, to the outhouse <laughs> during the night. So he needed me. And I used that. And I want all women in Iran they use that. This is 21st century. And I cannot believe that men are going to the stadium without caring about their sisters, without caring about their mothers, without caring about old women who are watching them and fighting for their basic rights. 
So I didn't let my brother to enjoy his freedom. Maybe you think this is really mean. But the mean thing is that you're watching men enjoying the freedom that they take it for granted from the government, from the Sharia laws, without challenging the law. So I used my personal story to encourage other women. And because I strongly believe that if you want to challenge the dictator, if you want to challenge the oppressors, if you want to challenge the Islamic Republic of Iran, first you have to start your own revolution, which I did from my kitchen. The kitchen in my village were designed, all the kitchen in the village, designed for women. Why? Because women are shorter than men. The thing was too low. My mother was shorter than my father. I was shorter than my brother. But guess what? I was working as hard as my brother in the farm. Trust me. My mother was working as far as my father in the farm. And my mother was a street peddler as well, like my father. But I couldn't believe that. After finishing our work, we were the one that we had to spend our time in the kitchen. Man rastegarim ro tu ashpas khone nemididam. Now, it, it, we have to, I have to say that in Persian because I had to spend the time in the kitchen and do all the cooking things. That was not my thing to do. So the sink was really low. So I had to find my own way. I found a chair and I asked my brother, there is a chair, sit down and one, wash the dishes and stay with me. So this is the way that I gained my freedom and I started my feminist revolution from my own kitchen which I strongly believe that every individual woman in Iran, they need to do. So from saying no, I learned how to be powerful. I was in Women in the World Summit, there were like 3,000 women, and Meryl Streep introduced me to give a talk. So the first question was that how I learned to be powerful, I couldn't find any feminist book and refer like from that. So, and I showed my brother picture, I showed my village and everything. And I got really emotional. Because in the village, the, the main word that I used to hear was, Ya Allah, go behind the curtain. And now I was giving a talk to 3,000 people. And I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know how to, to express myself. So I said, you know how? I learned from my pain to be powerful. I learned from poverty how to be powerful because I kept hearing my, in my life, if you are poor, everyone discriminates against you. And if you are poor, you have to think about bread. You have to think about money. You shouldn't think about freedom. You shouldn't ask about having the same right as your brother to ride a bicycle. That was too luxury because you are poor. Then. We had war. Two of my brothers, they got involved in the war between Iran and Iraq. Both of them got injured. So we had war. So many bigger problems around you. Then you're asking why you're not allowed to dance? No. We had revolution. So of course, after the mass execution, there were reformists. The only hope for women. Again, we were like hearing, shh. This is, a not, this is not the right time to talk about women's rights. So we had sanction. Again, it was not the right time to ask about women's rights. And I said in Women in the World Summit, this is the way that I learned. Any time when I wanted to talk about myself, my body was not the right time. So I got used to it, but I found a way that any time when someone tell me this is not the right time, this is the right time to talk about myself. This is how I started to talk about my body, my choice, and women's rights. But let's take you back to, my, to Iran. I got expelled from high school just because of that, because of asking too much questions, because of being critical. Then I became a journalist and I uh, exposed the corruption in Iranian parliament. As you know that if you do that here in America or any country in the West, you will win an award, you will get an award. My award was just being kicked out from Iranian parliament. 
So I got kicked out from everywhere, and I had to think about it. Again, my mom, her, her lesson helped me. And she used to tell me that any time you were a naughty girl, when you were kicked out from a room, you were able to find a window to sneak into the same room. So they kicked out me from everywhere, at the end from my homeland. So I had to look at for a window. My window is social media. I sneak into the same homeland, to my homeland. I am there every day through my campaign. So I became a nightmare now. As you know that, through our black and white TV in Iran, which you all know that, we were the one, the women, watching the clerics. All, you know, all the TV channels in Iran, when our, we, we had black and white TV, were just clerics talking about women's rights. Buddy, how your hijab is you know, causing earthquake, how your uh, hair is coughing, you know that. So right now, through their own TV, the clerics are watching me. And by me, I mean millions of other women. Because they say to themselves, if a village girl could make it and speak up, and the world is hearing her, everyone can do it. So right now, the loudest voice from Iran that you can hear is through Iranian women. And I'm going to give you one example. Some people might think that, you know, we, were, we are looking for a leader to bring change within the society. Have you ever heard of the name Vida Movahed, the girl of Revolution Street, before this movement? No, she was not a famous woman. She was an ordinary woman. But she launched her own revolution. For 40 years, we never had a chance never to talk about compulsory hijab. And I remember when I left Iran and I found my window when I started my own campaign, my selfie freedom, Azadiyya Yaboshaki, I used to get a lot of criticism. The people were saying that, you know, Cheru Yaboshaki, why you called it selfie? Azadi should be Azadi. Freedom is freedom. Freedom is not coming with any adjective, nothing. But that was not true. If you are a woman in Iran, you know the word Yawashaki, you know the word selfie, because our freedom was stolen from us. We were not allowed to sing, we were not allowed to dance, we were not allowed to show our hair, we were not allowed to have a mixed party. But we used to do it in a stealth, in secret, which doesn't scare the government of Iran. The only thing that can scare the government is when you talk about it loud. So that's why when I started my selfie freedom, all women, Join, who joined the campaign, they were expressing themselves because they were fed up with religion interference in their personal life and forcing them to go on their ground to have a normal life. So when I, when I started my Selfie Freedom, it was just three years online movement. Then I had to think about it because I, I, I used to talk to many brave women in Iran that they wanted to take to the street. So I picked a day called Wednesday, I mean, White Wednesday. I picked the color white because it's the color of peace. And I picked Wednesday because I had more free time. So, and I asked women, you know, to have a white symbol to identify each other in public. And I asked men to join them. And I was bombarded by videos from women practicing their civil disobedience in the street and protesting against compulsory hijab which is a punishable crime, as you know that. And some people, they ask me that, why you put them in danger? You live miles away from Iran. But these are the women who, you know, have to put themselves in danger and risk their lives. So I'm going to give you an example. One woman from White Wednesday, she was only 24 years old. When she got arrested, I was the one that I felt guilty. And I deleted all her photos and videos from my Instagram page. And guess what happened? I received another video from the same woman as soon as she got free from prison. In front of the court, she took off her white headscarf 
And she said that by arresting me, by threatening me, you cannot keep me silent. I say no to compulsory hijab louder. This is the women inside Iran. They are aware of the risk. These are the women like suffragists. They know that freedom is not free. They know that women in the history put themselves in danger and sacrificed their life to have the right to vote. And this is the way that Iranian women are trying to gain freedom, to bring freedom within the society. Then the street was not enough for women. They jumped on a platform. As I said, Vida Mubahid was the first woman. She went on a platform and she put the white headscarf on a stick like a flag. She waved it in public and through her act of protest, we had gears of revolution. From the beginning, I didn't know her name. So I just created a hashtag, where is the girl of Revolution Street? Because I wanted to know who she is. Instead of finding her, we found so many girls of Revolution Street. They repeated her protest. And now this protest became the main, one of the most prominent civil disobedient movement in Iran. So as you know that many clerics, they started to attack us. They started to name us and shame us by calling us a whore, prostitute. Imam Jum'e Sawe, Ahmad Khatami, Alam al Huda, some of the well-known clerics, they called us a whore. And it took me back from the time when I was a parliamentary journalist. I exposed the corruption, and my main question was about politics. What about, was about how much, you know, about the salaries, the pay slips, that's all. But all I was hearing was that, first, cover yourself, then ask your question. How many of you, as a woman, heard this in Iran? First, cover yourself, then ask your question. It means in Islamic Republic of Iran, men, those men who do not believe in freedom of choice, they don't care about what you say. They don't care about what you do. They care about what you wear and how you look. Let me give you an example. I'm a storyteller. I was in London. There was a pro-government strong man in front of me. And um, sometimes I'm, I'm used to hear a lot of compliments from Iranians, thank God. And he came to me and I prepared myself. If he said something nice, I say, thank you so much. You're so kind, this kind of thing. And he attacked me. He called me, you ugly woman. Why are you ruining the image of Iran? I wasn't expected that. So first I said that I am not the one who ruined the image of Iran. This is the Islamic Republic of Iran. This is the oppressors who are ruining the image of Iran. And those women, actually, who are fighting against these oppressors, they are actually showing the true face of Iran to the rest of the world. But he was not convinced. That didn't bother me. He called me ugly. And that bothered me a lot. <laughs> because first of all, I knew that men who want to you know, patronize you, who want to keep you silent, they attack your sexuality and they attack how you look. So first of all, I knew that in the eyes of my mother, I'm a beautiful daughter. In the eyes of my son, I'm a beautiful mother. In the eyes of my husband, I'm a beautiful wife. How could that she, he called me ugly. So I didn't know what to do. I got my camera, I ran after him, and I said that, repeat yourself. You called me ugly. My weapon is this, my camera, to expose your violence. Just repeat what you said. Guess what? He couldn't. And that is why I launched the new initiative. My camera is my weapon. And I asked women in Iran that this is our Me Too movement. According to the Supreme Leader of Iran, when the women in the West started to you know, expose the sexual harassment, the Supreme Leader of Iran said that this is your fault because you don't have hijab. So men cannot you know, control themselves, as you know. 
and um, that's why you get raped, you get sexually you know, harassed, that's your fault. This is funny, yeah? But the supreme leader of Iran said that. And he put the blame on the women. We had this experience in Iran for 40 years. The clerics, all you know, the um, judiciary system, they put the blame on us. So I asked the women inside Iran, the only way that we can have our Me Too movement is just using our camera. If someone sexually harass you in the street, or the morality police come to you and ask you to cover yourself, be your own media, be your own storyteller, be your own voice. Instead of being a victim, be a warrior. Use your camera and ask them to repeat themselves. Challenge them. So as you know, some of you Iranian might follow the page, um, the hashtag, my camera is my weapon. Now, millions of Iranian are aware that this is the time that women are not waiting for the law to be changed. They are walking on wild in the street and they are filming the reaction. If some men are sexually harassing them, these are the women standing up and filming them, shaming them. You might see one of the video, a woman filming a morality police, actually. And the morality police said, said to her, cover yourself. And um, if you don't cover yourself, just leave Iran. So what she said, Iran is my country, it's my homeland, and I want to live here. I'm not going to leave Iran. And you, ha you are the one, you have to respect my choice. One of the other women from my camera is my weapon, got attacked. And that video got 9 million views. Trust me, the supreme leader of Iran doesn't get that much views. <laughs> Rouhani, even the smiley foreign minister of Iran doesn't get that much views. That shows the power of ordinary women in Iran who are launching their own revolution. So anytime when you lose your hope, just go to this hashtag, which I cannot find it, I need your help now, and watch them, hear their voice, and I'm going to show you the video, which gives you hope that this is the true face of Iran. Yes! Root of Okonumbar! ای کاش زنان ایرانی می دیدن صدای دست دادن رو می شیدن شاید یک روزی الان شاید با اسمهای بدی این زنان رو مورد خطاب قرار میدن ولی من مطمئنم تاریخ به تک تک این زنانی که به تنهای پای من دوباره دارم فارسی حرف میدن I said that right now they might be labeled by the clerics in Iran as a whore or I myself they call me ugly duckling they call me the agent of MI6 they called me the agent of CIA they called me the agent of Donald Trump <laughs> my life has been affected by visa ban but 
This is how the clerics, you know, see the people around when they're fighting for their freedom. But one day, I am sure the history will be proud of every individual woman who became, a, became the agent of change in Iran. Every individual woman who became a headache for the oppressors in Iran. I'm sure. <laughs> Delam Kuchike, I have to say that. They call me Ugly Duckling, but they don't know the end of the story of Ugly Duckling. <laughs> <laughs> so we have so many challenges. In this part, I want to talk about why the global movement, women's movement, do not support our struggle against compulsory hijab. They have four arguments by day, I mean, female politicians who go to my beautiful country and visit Iran, some of the feminists, some of the people, you know, left, some of them, not all of them. I'm, I don't want to categorize them. They have four arguments that they don't want to support Iranian movement, especially against compulsory hijab. First, they say this is a small issue. Come on, I have a simple question. All of you, when you were planning to come to this event, the first thing before leaving your house was what? What to wear? What to wear? Looking at the mirror. You look at yourself in the mirror to make yourself beautiful. For 40 years, we had to look at ourselves in the mirror to make ourselves someone else, which the government of Iran wants us to be. You call this as a small issue? This is about my dignity. This is about my identity. I don't want anyone to tell me how to behave, what to wear, and what kind of lifestyle to follow. If anyone in the West come and tell you this is a small issue, have a headscarf and force her to wear it. Then they will understand. I did that. Believe me, it worked. I was in a conference. There was a man. So I don't know why my example comes from men, but first of all, thank you all men being here and supporting women's rights movement. Thank you so much. But there was a man actually among the crowd called me and said that there are so many bigger problems. Why you care so much about small piece of cloth? I don't have it. I got my small piece of cloth. I went there and I asked him to wear it for 30 minutes. Listen to my talk. For 30 minutes, I promise you, I'm going to talk about bigger problems. He didn't. Not only refused, he was really angry because I, you know, pushed him to do that. And he told me, you're insulting me because I just wanted to ask a question. I say, this is not, in my opinion, it's not a big problem. It's not, there are so many bigger problems in the, in the Middle East. But now you're insulting me. I said, yes. That is the point. By forcing a woman for 40 years, you're insulting us. But apart from that, you're insulting yourself. Because the government of Iran believed that you're a weak man. You cannot control yourself by just seeing that much of my hair. So this is an insult to the whole nation, not only to those women. That is why this is not a small issue. And to challenge this argument, if it's a small issue, why the Islamic Republic of Iran spend million, I mean, billion bishtari or milliard? The same, you know, they spend a lot of money to keep this, because this is the main pillar of the Islamic Republic. This is the genetic code of the Islamic Republic. So this is not a small issue when the Islamic Republic cares so much about it. The only way, when you go to my beautiful country and you understand this is Islamic Republic, it's true women. Because we have to carry the main ideology of the Islamic Republic on our body. Then you call it a small issue? Only in one year, 2014, before launching my campaign, we had the statistics. 3.6 million women were arrested or warned 
or stopped in the street or sent to the court. Why? Not being unveiled because of having inappropriate hijab. If this is a small issue, why? 40,000 cars was impound were impounded just because women were driving unveiled inside the car. So this is not a small issue. When you will be kicked out from the airport, tell that to all the female politicians if they say this is a small issue. You will be kicked out from the airport and they won't let you to solve bigger problems just because of this small piece of cloth. And another argument, they say this is a law and the law should be respected. Some even go you know, more further, like saying, um, here in America, if you break a law, then what's going to happen to you? But slavery used to be legal in America as well. If nobody objected against the slavery, I mean, I cannot believe that. Right now, in 21st century, some people argue that you have to respect the discriminatory law. This is a simple question. All men here, I have a question. If here in America, you go to a stadium and they tell you this is a law, only white people or only men are allowed to go to the stadium, what would you do and what people in America do? Honestly, tell me, how many of you men here are going to a stadium if women are not allowed to go? Raise a hand. None of you, but I trust me, all of them are going to go in Iran. <laughs> none of you. None of you. Because this is, this is a discriminatory law. So you cannot say that this is a law and we should respect the law. And I'm going to tell you that Burkini ban was a law in France as well. The whole world were united to condemn Burkini ban. Nobody said that this is a law. Travel ban here. All people got united, and they supported the minorities' right. There are, in the history, there are so many law that people started to break the bad law to make it a respectable law. This is what the Iranian women are doing every day, practicing their civil disobedience. So at the same day, when women were breaking compulsory hijab law and protesting discriminatory law, Three female politicians from Netherlands was in Iran, and they were obeying the same law. And my argument is this, so simple. When you're legitimizing a discriminatory law, you are actually empowering the government of Iran to put more pressure on the women inside Iran. And there was like feminists from Sweden. I am sure many of you uh, saw the famous picture when they started to, uh, they published a picture of themselves to challenge uh, President Trump's cabinet. The picture was all feminists, all female from Sweden, and saying that to Donald Trump that women and men are equal. So those feminists went to my country, all of them, they said to President Rouhani, well, men are more equal than women, because they all obeyed compulsory hijab law without even challenging it. Why? Because it's a law. So and I send them a letter and I ask them to think about it. If the West come with a law and say that all the Muslim you know, um, female politicians, all the Muslim women should remove their hijab, what would they do? The first voice you can hear is from Islam, would be from Islamic Republic of Iran. They will all protest. And another question. If if there is a tournament in America and they say that the condition for all, the, all of the athletes to participate in this tournament is just being unveiled, not wearing Muslim hijab, what would happen? All people, media, all the Muslim and non-Muslim people, they get united and they protest. That is, why, uh, that is what I want. When it happens in Islamic Republic of Iran, I don't understand why people keep silent. There was a tournament in Iran, and um, one of the American chess champions, Nazi Pakitse, she said that 
I read the news and I followed the campaign, my selfie freedom campaign, and I found out if I go to Iran, I had to wear the compulsory hijab. So I won't attend. Guess who got the attack? You think the Islamic Republic of Iran? No, the 19-year-old chess player. Even the elites, even the, um, some of the political activists, even some of the women's rights activists, they attacked her instead of atting, attacking the Islamic Republic of Iran and asking them to remove this discriminatory law. Why the third argument has come here now? Because they, they strongly believe this is an internal matter and we shouldn't interfere in any internal matter. This is wrong because the Islamic Republic of Iran not only forced the women inside Iran to wear hijab, they forced all the female politicians, they forced all the tourists, non-Iranian, they, for, you know, they, they forced all people who want to visit Iran to wear hijab. So as far as the government of Iran forcing all non-Iranians to obey a discriminatory law, then this is a global issue. You cannot call it internal matter. And more importantly, human rights, it's a global issue. Why you care so much about Gaza? Why you care so much about Palestine? Why you care so much about Lebanon? But when it comes to Islamic Republic of Iran, you say this is an internal matter? A Barbie girl wearing hijab can make a news for CNN, Washington Post, but millions of seven-year-old girls in Iran who are forced to wear hijab, they are not news? These are internal matter? Fourth arg argument, that they keep silent. They say that this is a cultural issue. Then let me give you a better picture of cultural issue. Gay marriage in America, what happened? People fought for that right. Apartheid, what happened for apartheid system? If people say, like, you know, this is a cultural issue, let's not get interfere. And most importantly, this is an insult to Iranian women when they say that, you know, this is part of Iranian culture and we shouldn't, we shouldn't get interfered. Before the revolution, women had the right to choose what they wanted to wear. How compulsion was never been part of our culture. And culture is not written on a stone. Culture is something flexible. It changes. Generation by generation, it changes. And that is what we have been doing. Javad Zarif, our foreign minister, was in France. And actually, um, he got challenged by one of the female politicians that why are you forcing us to wear hijab? Guess what he said? He used the same argument. Because he heard that a lot from you know, some of the feminists around the world. So he said that this is our culture, and you have to respect our culture. So I was really furious. I didn't know what to do. I photoshopped him in hijab. And I said, if this is a culture, you yourself respect the culture. <laughs> and his picture in hijab made another initiative in Iran. Men started to wear hijab and to show their solidarity with women inside Iran, saying that we don't think that we, you know, we own the women. We don't think that women who do not believe in hijab, they are, you know, against our honor. You know that the word qayrat. We are not bighayrat if we don't force our, you know, wife, our mother, our sister to, to wear hijab. So the last argument, which we have a lot of, you know, fight to convince people that please ignore this, Islamophobia. I'm sure that you heard that a lot in the news. When we, the women from the Middle East, are fighting for our right, we keep hearing that you're causing Islamophobia. Shh, keep silent. I'm asking a simple question. You think that law, Sharia law, which punished me as a woman to get lashes just because of mixing, attending a mixed party, causing Islamophobia, or me protesting against this oppressive, oppressing law. Which one? You think this is me 
and millions of other women in Iran causing Islamophobia by fighting those oppressors and telling them that you are not the one to force us from the age of seven to cover ourselves. Those law who actually punish people to get executed, to get lashes, to leave their country and live in exile, to be, the, to be separated from their families. These laws are causing Islamophobia, if there is such a thing. But I created my own expression. Those people who are talking about Islamophobia, they never live in a country which all the government and many men in Iran have womenophobia. I know there is no such a word, but think about it. Think about it. In all our life, they have phobia of women. And as a woman from Iran, I am the one actually have the right to be scared of Sharia law. Nobody can tell me, keep silent, you're causing Islamophobia. Yes, I'm scared of Sharia law. I am scared of the Islamic political Islam because we are all victims of political Islam. So this is the term that they're trying to keep us silent. And I want to invite all, you know, the female politicians who go to Iran, all the feminists, and all of you here, be loud and tell the rest of the world that this is the time when women in Iran putting themselves in danger and risking their lives, don't use the word Islamophobia to keep silent and to empower those Islamist extremists in Iran to put more pressure on the women. We are coming from Middle East. We carry the scores of war. We carry the scores of sanction. We carry the scores of discrimination. And we learned from our pain how to be powerful and never keep silent. And believe me, supporting women's rights in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, and talking about those oppressors, condemning all those Sharia law who count women as second class citizen, doesn't make you Islamophobic. And I'm going to end my uh, talk by giving you an example. As I said that, for the Islamic Republic of Iran, there's three pillars, death to America, death to Israel, and women. I want to challenge this argument. The biggest enemy for the Islamic Republic of Iran is its own women. When I received a death threat, there was a Basiji giving um, an interview to BBC Persian. On his interview, he threatened me. He said that I'm going to butcher Masih Alinejad. I'm going to cut her chest and send it to her parents. He said that on, a, on an interview with BBC. Of course, from the beginning, it was disgusting for me. It was scary as well. But I strongly believe if someone want to do that, they never say that. They're too bozdel. But I had to use this opportunity to show the rest of the world this is how we, the women in, in Iran, are facing. These person who are threatening me is free to give an interview to BBC. But those women who are peacefully protesting against compulsory job, they're getting you know, sentenced to prison. So I went to the Iran interest section in Washington, DC to make a complaint. As I know, and you might know, I never had a hope that the judiciary system in Iran gonna help me. But I asked Nasrin Sutudeh, one of the bravest lawyers in Iran who is right now in jail, to accept, you know, to represent my cause in Iranian court, and she accepted. So I went to an Iran interest um, section in, in, in Washington, D.C., and guess what happened? They asked me if you wanna make official complaint about the person who uh, threaten you, you have to wear a hijab. <laughs> I said, come on, I'm fighting against compulsory hijab, and that is why I receive a death threat. <laughs> and now you're asking me to wear a hijab and then make an official complaint? So that actually shows for the Islamic Republic of Iran, my life is not as important as my hair. <laughs> so 
I did what the girls of Revolution of Revolutionary Street is doing. I did the same thing what Iranian women has been doing. I practiced my civil disobedience in Washington, D.C. I ran without hijab, and guess what they did? They called the United States Secret Service. <laughs> so they called the police of their biggest enemy to save themselves from an unveiled Iranian woman. <laughs> that is why I strongly believe for the Islamic Republic of Iran, the biggest enemy are those women who dare to challenge them. So imagine I was only one. If all of you, or some of you, join me and do exactly what the Iranian women inside do, nobody can stop us. Nobody can keep us silent. We have responsibility. We cannot just watch them. We can be the ambassador, every individual of us. I strongly believe that if we, we want to help democracy, we cannot just watch those people who are going to jail, who are going to prison and keep silent. We can be their voices. And change only comes through the women inside Iran if we help them and be their voices. Do not ignore Iranian women. Thank you so much. Thank you.